So this is what it looks like. When we, when we set the phase such that the, um, such that the photon only goes to the right, we get this uh, wave packet out the right, and we get basically nothing on the left side. Similarly, when we set it to go left, we see the photon out the left side with this wave packet, but nothing on the right. Um, and again, what we're measuring at room temperature actually um, are the field operators, the creation and annihilation operators uh, shown here, because we're actually measuring a voltage and we need to average quite a bit to get these results and repeat the measurement many times. So when we do that, we can do tomography of the photon state that comes out where we're checking all different uh, contractions of different field operators. Um, and what you can see is that by and large, the tallest one corresponds to the number operator of a photon going left or a photon going right. And if we equate that to a fidelity, we're creating the directional emission of a photon with 95, 96% uh, fidelity. So now, we're working on a modular network, and this is work by Aziza and Beatrice. And the idea is that we would have many of these modules, say, um, aligned. Each one is connected to its own quantum processing unit that we would like to connect. And on the other side, there's a waveguide uh, that runs through them all. And so the idea is that we would send a photon, say, from an emitter to an absorber. We might then send it back. And by tuning the frequencies, we can decide who's going to absorb and who will just ignore that photon. The first experiment we did is just two of these. We have two different chips, and each one is in their own package. And so this is one package here, this is the other package, and then there's a coax cable that connects the two. And we send a photon uh, from the left to the right and from the right to the left. There's package one, there's package two, and there's a niobium-titanium coax that connects them together. So the first step is to shape the photon because emission and absorption can be run in, the, the absorption can be the time reversal of the emission if it's time symmetric. And so working on that, we are able to get, you know, by some metric, um, high degree of symmetry. And basically the way we shape the photon is, remember, we shuttle it from the, where we created the entanglement to where it's emitted. And the rate at which we move that entangled state down allows us to shape how the photon comes out. So that, that's what we did there. So the protocol is, is a similar one on the creation side. We first uh, excite one of the qubits. We then create the uh, I swap gate. And now qubits, these two qubits are now entangled. And then at the next step, simultaneously, we both emit the photon to the waveguide and we absorb it on this side. And then what we do is we either measure, well, we do both. We measure this qubits here to see did they, in fact, get excited in the right way. And we also look for photons that might have gone outside the bridge. Okay. So it turns out there are 73 different parameters here, and I won't read through them all. But we, we use reinforcement learning to tune them all. Um, I think Aziza did it by hand once and then thought maybe this would be a better way. So the way that it works is you, you basically start with a physics-based, uh, you think, okay, this should be the right pulse. And then you choose some trial pulse. In fact, the first time it is that physics-based pulse. You send it down, you run the experiment, you collect and you define a reward and you collect it and you ask how well did I do against that reward. Basically, we'd love it all to be absorbed. We then use that to update a neural network, compute some gradients, and that determines the next trial. Um, and that is called one epoch. And then over many, many epochs, you can increase the reward, meaning that we're getting closer and closer to the ideal situation that we would like. And so that's how we did the tune-up um, based on this work by Leon Ding and Max Hayes. So for rightward fo photon absorption, this is some data, recent data. Yep, five minutes, thank you. So in the first case, what we're going to do is we're going to turn off the absorber module we emit a photon from the right. It should pass by here and only go to the right. So we should see a photon on the right at room temperature. We do. We see a little bit over here due to reflections related to this coax cable and the connectors. The next thing we can do is we can turn on the absorber, meaning that this photon should get absorbed and go to qubits uh, 7 and 8. And that means that we shouldn't see the photon at room temperature. And we shouldn't see the photon on the left either. And that's exactly what we see. 
Now, if we look at the qubits themselves, we can measure qubits three and four and see that they are decaying. They start off roughly 50% each because it's in an entangled state. And they both decay to zero, which is the emission of the photon. And on the right, we can measure qubits seven and eight. We see that it actually absorbs the photon. And this, these ideally should be the same, uh, but they're not. They're a little bit off. But we're seeing that we're getting population in seven and eight. Now, this measurement doesn't prove they're entangled. We'll look at that in a moment. But it shows that it's, you know, this is the degree to which it's working. So that's for a photon going right. The maximum absorbed po uh, population is about 63%. If we look at one going left, it's the same story. We create it on this side. We can see those two qubits emit their photon. This time it works a little better. Um, both photons are absorbed and about the same, populations in three and four. And you can see that in this case, since we're sending the photon to the left, if the absorber is off, we get the photon uh, at room temperature. When, when it's on, we only get a little bit left. Okay, so, so it's working the way we expect. So if we, if we do state tomography um, of a leftward photon or rightward photon, we're now checking to see if the two qubits are entangled in the emitter, in the absorber, or sorry, in the absorber once it absorbs. We see that um, we're getting about 60% fidelity. Uh, that's first step, so uh, we can do better. Um, but it's more than 0.5, which means that it is entangled, um, concurrence. So the you could ask, where, where are we losing uh, this fidelity? Well, there's some propagation loss, about 16%. Um, the qubit decoherence is, about, is contributing about 10%. Uh, we've got 3 4% in directionality error, and then about 6% in missed absorption. So, so these two on the left, uh, we can definitely improve. So the Bell state fidelity is around 0.6. The concurrence is also around 0.6. So this is, uh, these are entangled. Uh, and the error budget, we account for about 32%. So we should be in the 90s if we can address all of these issues. So the last thing I'd like to show then is that we can remotely entangle qubits three and four with qubits seven and eight. And that's a resource, distributed entanglement. And the idea is that, for example, we're emitting now from the, uh, from the emitter module, sorry, this one's the emitter module, we're emitting, right, the qubit populations go to zero, and at the same time, the qubit populations increase on the absorber. But what we can do is we can stop it halfway. So we're basically emitting half a photon. And when we do that, these four qubits will now be entangled. And we'll form this W state where you can see that the excitation is distributed between the four qubits, but it's coherent. And there's a phase factor here related to the distance between the emitter and the absorber. And so when we do this, again, we find that the fidelity um, is around 62%, both for a leftward photon and for a rightward photon. Again, indicating that, you know, at least within the error budget we've got, this is working the way that we expect it to. So that's where we're at. This data is from about a month ago. And with that, um, let me acknowledge all the folks at the uh, Engineering Quantum Systems Group at MIT, as well as our sister group out at MIT's Lincoln Laboratory. The, the many sponsors who um, enabled this work, and let me also thank you for your attention.